You are listening to Literacy, a lecture that is part of the Applied Linguistics program at Macquarie University, taught by Ingrid Piller and part of the Language on the Move network. The big question of today's lecture is, how does literacy affect the human mind? Ever since literacy practices went beyond the spreadsheet technology that writing originally was, as you know from an earlier lecture, humans have known that reading and writing do something to us. Literacy expands our minds and changes who we are. As Dr. Seuss tells us, the more that you read, the more things you will know, the more that you learn, the more places you'll go. Reading not only engages our intellect, but also our emotions and ethics. As the American novelist, playwright and activist James Baldwin said, Books taught me that the things that tormented me most were the very things that connected me with all the people who were alive, who had ever been alive. I could go on and on with quotes in praise of reading. So the idea that literacy works on the human mind and does so in a good way has been around for a long time and can be found in many cultures. However, Scientific investigation of the connection between literacy and mind only started in the 1960s. Its first research incarnation came in the work of the British anthropologist Jack Goody, who argued in a series of publications that the development of writing is associated with key cognitive advances in human society. In particular, Goody credited the invention of the Greek alphabet with constituting a divide in the history of the human mind. Therefore, the theories that draw on Jack Goody's work are often known as the Great Divide theories. They posit that a great divide separates literate and non-literate minds and civilizations. For Goody and other great divide theorists, these differences relate to the following. They suggest that literacy divides prehistory from history, that non-literate people have myth while literate people are said to have history. They also suggest that literacy leads to the development of logic and syllogistic forms of reasoning, that it facilitates the development of certain mathematical procedures such as um, long division and multiplication, and that literacy leads to a shift towards greater abstractedness. These theories have been widely accused of being Eurocentric because they linked all these achievements specifically to the Greek alphabet and hence the foundation of Western civilization. However, for Goody, these points constituted more of a research program and like hypotheses about the relationship between literacy and mind than accepted facts. He wanted to start a debate and he certainly achieved that. Research in literacy and mind has virtually exploded since then. A significant milestone that did a lot to throw the Great Divide theories into question was the 1981 publication of the book The Psychology of Literacy by the American psychologists Sylvia Scribner and Michael Cole. The book is based on a study of literacy among the Vi. The Vai are an ethnic group whose ancestral lands are located in the area that's shaded green on your map and that's what today constitutes Liberia and um, Sierra Leone in Western Africa. The Vai language uses a unique syllabary script which you can see on the right and which may well constitute another independent invention of writing going back to our discussion about how often was writing invented. 
The Vi, in addition to their unique script, have also a unique multilingual and multilateral social organization. At the time of Scribner and Coles' study, um, about 20% of the Vi population were literate in Vi. Another 16, or maybe the same 16, also had some degree of literacy in Arabic, which they mostly got from reading the Holy Quran. And around 6% of the population were literate in English. Unlike most writing, Vi literacy is not associated with formal schooling. It is not acquired in school. Learning how to read and write in Vi is a matter of personal interest and it is learned in the course of daily activities. Can you imagine how that works? Well, a typical scenario might involve a Vi person moving away from their village. Let's say a young man from a hill village to work on the plantations near the coast. Now, back in the village, his sweetheart goes about moaning how much she misses him until some elder takes pity on her and says, hey, you know what? I know a nifty little trick that will you allow you to reconnect with your loved one. And so as the two go about their everyday work, the elder teaches the other person one syllable sign here, maybe by writing in the sand, maybe by drawing it um, with the finger in the air and so on and so forth. And so they teach each other one syllable at a time and basically in no time, sweetheart knows how to write a love letter. And voila, you've got a person who has learned how to read and write outside of formal schooling as a matter of personal interest and in the course of their daily activity. This situation provides a unique context where effects of literacy on the mind can be distinguished from effects of schooling on the mind. Because the effects of literacy and schooling are really pretty much conflated in almost any other context. So the researchers subjected Vi informants to a series of tests of pattern recognition and logical reasoning of the kind that are typically found in IQ tests. Tasks similar to the one that you see in the image here. What Scribner and Cole found contradicted the Great Divide theory. They say, Vi script literacy does not fulfill the expectations of those social scientists, like Jack Goody, who consider literacy a prime mover in social change. It has not set off a dramatic modernizing sequence. It has not been accompanied by, a rapid, by rapid developments in technology, art and science. It has not led to the growth of new intellectual disciplines. In other words, whether someone was literate in Vi or not made no difference to their performance on various psychometric tests. What did make a difference was schooling. The researchers found that it was not literacy in Vi that made a difference to test performance, but urban living and above all, formal schooling. People with formal education did not only perform more highly on the tasks themselves, but they also showed better ability to provide verbal explanations and they were able to provide more task oriented and informative justifications. The researchers conclude that schooling affects verbal explanations over and above any influences it may exert on successful execution of the task. And by the way, as a side note, all the photos from Scribner and Coles' fieldwork on the slides that I have shown you have been sourced from a really wonderful website, the Laboratory of Comparative Human Cognition, which has a, what they call 
Polyphonic Autobiography Project to tell the story of research affiliated with the organization. You can see the URL here on the slide, but you can also find it by Googling the story of LCHC. To sum up the story so far, Scribner and Cole found no evidence for literacy in itself having an effect on cognition. What they did found was that formal schooling had a significant, that formal schooling had the significant effect. So not literacy, but formal schooling. What this ultimately means is that it is impossible to determine how literacy in the abstract affects the human mind because we don't have literacy in the abstract. The ability to read and write is acquired in specific contexts and we engage with literacy through specific practices. This brings us back to the importance of literacy events, which we first encountered in our exploration of Shirley Bryce Heath's research about bedtime stories. When Bryce Heath compared the practices about reading for young children in three different communities, she found that different people do different things with words. And likewise, they have different ways of taking from text, as she calls it, retrieving information from text, creating new knowledge on the basis of text. The research of Scribner and Cole demonstrates that only some ways of taking from texts, namely those that are acquired through formal schooling, lead to the kinds of effects that Goody had hypothesized would follow from literacy in the abstract. That is the development of logic and syllogistic forms of reasoning, the development of certain mathematical procedures, a general shift towards greater abstractedness. Now, does all this mean that only formally schooled literacy is cognitively beneficial or has mind effects? Certainly not. Scribner and Coles's research has actually nothing to say about the cognitive effects of VI literacy. That is because they only tested for cognitive effects that are typically associated with formal schooling, like those IQ type tests. Surely the mind of people literate in VI is also altered. But what they learn is not abstract reasoning, Maybe they learn the importance of maintaining family connections across distance, or maybe they learn the importance of creative expression through the arts. I can only guess. The key point I'm making is that literacy cannot be divorced from the content it encodes. The distinction between the signs and the symbols that make up the writing system and the content encoded in texts using those signs and symbols that is typical. So this distinction is typical foundational to modern linguistics, but it is entirely artificial. Contemporary neuroscience clearly makes this point. And I now turn to the work of Marion Wolf, a US cognitive neuroscientist and developmental psycholinguist who specializes in researching the reading brain. In her work, Wolf highlights the deep interconnection between literacy and the human brain. Reading changes our lives and our lives change our reading, as she says in one of her books. To understand how literacy changes the brain, we need to understand one key fact about the human brain, its neuroplasticity. Neuroplasticity means that the human brain develops and changes across the lifespan. Essentially, the brain, think of the brain as a muscle, which you can train to Olympic level performance by reading or let go to waste by never exercising it. Now, neuroplasticity works on three levels, chemical, structural, and functional. At the chemical level, 
the brain functions by transferring chemical signals between brain cells. Different types of brain activity concentrate chemical activity in different areas allocated to processes such as vision, hearing, touch or motor control. If lots of chemical activity happens in a specific area, over time this leads to an actual physical change, a structural change in the area of the brain that keeps getting exercised. A famous example that you may have heard of is um, a study that shows that the hippocampus of London taxi drivers is much larger than the hippocampus of other people, non-taxi drivers. Now the hippocampus is an area of the brain that is responsible for memory and navigation and it is obvious that a taxi driver would really exercise the memory and navigation functions of their brain a lot. Um, or at least they would have until the advent of GPS. In fact, it might be interesting um, to repeat this study today and see whether the hippocampus of a taxi driver relying on automated navigation is still larger than that of other people or has now shrunk to the size of us non-taxi drivers. Uh, back to neuroplasticity. In addition to chemical and physical plasticity, the third way that the brain can change itself is by altering the actual function of a brain area. You may have heard, for example, that language is located in two specific parts of our brain. One part is in the left frontal lobe that specializes um, in speech and it's known as Broca's area. And the other part is in the left temporal lobe that specializes in understanding language and hearing and it is known as Wernicke's area. This is really a very rough characterization and it's very weak on the details and it's of course much much more complex. But the key point that I want to make is that different parts of the brain have different functions but these functions are not fixed and the brain can actually shift functions around too and allocate them to different areas if needed. So our brain is really the most amazing thing. Neuroplasticity means that our brain can remake itself by undergoing chemical, physical and functional changes. Now the plain English word that we have for this is learning. And that's where literacy comes in. Literacy is like brain cardio. It's a high level kind of exercise that actually literally alters your brain. And this can be demonstrated with modern methods such as brain scans. Our ancestors who spoke about how reading has changed them were right all along. Reading exercises four different brain functions in the areas where they occur. Vision, hearing, language and cognition. As you will recall from our first lecture, we defined literacy as visual language. So it's obvious how vision comes in. Our eyes look at words on the page, at those images and they recognize them as letters or as characters. So the first task of reading is visual recognition of symbols. Hearing may be a bit less obvious, but hearing comes in as our brain then needs to link those visual symbols that it has recognized to specific sounds of our language. Language is obvious again, the brain connects those by now, it's the fused visual auditory symbol or sign. The brain connects this fused visual and auditory sign to the meaning of words and to grammatical structures. And that linguistic signal is then linked to cognition. We read to learn, to think, to understand. 
Now, of course, I've terribly simplified this when I said, well, first the brain, you know, gets a visual signal from the eyes and recognizes that. Then it connects the image to a sound. Then it connects the image that is now fused to a sound to language. And then it connects the image that is now fused to sound and language to cognition. That's totally artificial because in reality, all these processes happen simultaneously or virtually simultaneously. They happen in a split second. The speed at which these actually really complex processes happen in the reading brain is just flabbergasting. However, divvying up the reading process like this is the first indicator of the complexity of reading and the marvel of humans actually being able to read. And expert readers do much more than what I've just told you. As this um, diagram that you see here on the slide um, shows, the diagram is from Wolf's book, Tales of Literacy for the 21st century. What the diagram tries to show is um, on the basis of um, brain scans and magnetic resonance images, on the basis of those findings, it kind of tries to show what goes on where in the brain as people engage in deep reading. As you can see, deep reading involves virtually all areas of the brain. It involves both hemispheres as we integrate orthographic forms, phonological processes, semantics and syntax with inference, evaluation, problem solving, hypotheses, testing, and all to arrive at new insights. The timing of all these processes is unimaginably fine-tuned. Our visual processing has to be slightly ahead of our cognitive processing, but still fuse it all into a new understanding. And even more amazing is actually the end product, and end product obviously in quotation marks, the end product of this process. It is not the, what we then have in our brains, basically, um, is not a one-on-one -on -one replication of the words on the page that somehow get sucked into our brains. That's not what happens. What happens is that the brain creates something new on the basis of the stimulus in the book or that it's been reading. So the brain merges the new knowledge gained from the page with what we already know. And in the process, we generate new insight that is special and specific to each individual reader. Yet at the same time, connected to generally agreed upon meanings to the hive mind of humanity. A good way to think about the incredible brain power involved in reading a book is to compare the experience of reading a novel with watching a film based on the novel. When we read, we basically have to make a movie in our head. We have to envision all the characters and scenes. We have to come up with our own interpretations and meanings. That's pretty much exactly what a movie does too. But the movie envisions someone else's characters and scenes and interpretations and meanings. And that's why most people will find watching a film that is based on a novel that they like really disappointing. The movie may be highly creative, but it's the creativity of someone else's mind. We haven't put in the hard work ourselves. In short, to sum it all up, literacy is truly mind-altering magic. Sadly, not everyone has the opportunity to learn to read to high enough levels to experience this mind-altering magic. So next time, we'll consider various types of readers and what it means to be left behind with low levels of literacy in the 21st century.